Hey guys, Rich here, and today we're going to A, your cues. We're also going to give you a bridge update, look back at some of the food, and we're gonna go over to my friend Trevor's place and make some sausage, gravy, and biscuit empanadas. I think they're gonna be fantastic. Let's take a run. So as the channel's gotten a little bit more popular, I've been getting a lot of questions here on YouTube and also over on Reddit. And I thought I'd answer some of them today. First one goes back to the video I made going into Mineral Canyon. And they wanted to know about the surface there, if it was sand or dirt, and what difference that made in how you approached that strip. So the surface didn't really matter. This airplane has larger tires, not too small, not too big, but definitely enough to handle Mineral Canyon. The real challenge there is the surrounding terrain. So you're down in a canyon, and you have to be pretty confident in your skills and in your airplane to get down there because you're surrounded on all sides by canyon walls, and you have to be willing to fly down the river on approach at the right altitude to make, it a, uh, to make a landing. And then you also have to be willing to, on takeoff, follow the river again until you get enough altitude to get out of the canyon. And some people, they don't like doing stuff like that. That's fine. They shouldn't do it then. Uh, for me, it's part of the backcountry camping, flying, and cooking thing that uh, everybody on this channel likes. Next question was, when you go to Mexico, what are the processes and procedures that you have to do there? And can you do the same kind of off-airport landings and camping uh, that we see you do everywhere else? Unfortunately, in Mexico, there is no off-airport. So the camping limitations are for places that you can fly into that are officially sanctioned and will let you camp there. Uh, to get into Mexico, uh, and to get back to the U.S. for that matter, it's basically the same process each direction. You go to immigration, you go to customs, uh, in the case of Mexico, then you go to operations to get fuel, and then you go to the Comandancia to file a flight plan, and that's really all there is to it. It's not very complicated. It is, in Mexico, a little bit more time-consuming. Uh, depending on the airport, it could take you between 15 minutes and 45 minutes to do those, those procedures. But, in Mexico, I haven't had people give me problems trying to get into the country. And unfortunately, I have to say that coming back to the U.S., on at least three, maybe four occasions, I have had trouble. The, the problems have been with the EAPA system, which is a system for alerting them as to who's coming into the country. And on multiple occasions, they have lost that paperwork. And on one of the occasions, they were just really rude about getting things sorted out. It was unfortunate because there was no reason that it had to be that way. In the case of the especially rude one, I had the receipt on my laptop. Well, in the case of all of them, I had the receipt on my laptop. The other two let me go out and get it. In the case of the really rude one, he wouldn't let me go out to the plane. Wanted to have like a 20-minute conversation at the airport accusing me of all kinds of nefarious things until I finally convinced him to let me go out to the plane. I go out to the plane, I come back with my laptop, show him that I've got everything, and he seems actually kind of annoyed that I had proven him wrong by actually having the paperwork that I was supposed to have. So not a big fan of situations like that. But on the whole, crossing the border is easy, would recommend it to anybody. And the plus side in return for doing stuff like that is that I've gotten to do some really fun flying down there. So I fly down to Puerto Angel quite a bit and fly along the coast from Acapulco to Puerto Angel. And it's really just some of the most beautiful flying you could ever hope to do. I've seen, in a single trip, whales with calves. They come down during the winter to, to have their, their babies. I've seen schools of hundreds of turtles. I've seen pods of dozens of dolphins, uh, fishermen chasing after schools of fish. Uh, it's, it's just been a real pleasure to do that kind of thing. And then we've also gotten to do some really fun events. So we did some Young Eagle style events down there to introduce kids to the opportunities that aviation presents. And what we did that was a little bit different in, in the U.S., the events are, are open to everybody. Uh, what we did was a little bit different. Well, we went to the teachers at the local schools and said, hey, who are your best students who's working hard and uh, trying to get something done for themselves? And we recruited uh, a few dozen in each case, four or five or six planes, depending on which event it was, and took those students up for flights. And the first one I did was a long time ago, and I, I have since learned that uh, one of the girls that was in one of my flights personally 
uh, was in fact inspired by everything that was going on and is now in school to work ATC. One of the other questions was, what was your favorite trip? Got our solar panels out in front of us here. That's a big project that's been under development for a few years now. I like to think that's being pumped right into my house. But what was my favorite trip? So I've, I've gotten to do some great stuff. Uh, out in Idaho, one of my favorite landing strips is Moose Creek. Uh, another one is Wilson Bar. Uh, both have great hiking in the area. Both have rivers there. Uh, one of my buddies used to get out of his plane and put a six pack into a mesh sack and turn the river to get it chilled down. Um, outside of Idaho, you know, there's uh, Ryan Field in Montana next to Glacier National Park. It's hard to go wrong with that one. But Utah is really beautiful as well. I've done less flying there so far. Hoping to get back there soon. And no kai dome. It's just an absolutely ridiculously beautiful place to uh, to camp. It's a beautiful night, beautiful sunset. I was there for almost a week, and I only saw one family in a UTV coming to scout out some sheep that they were hoping to hunt. And it doesn't hurt at all, but that was one of the best meals as well. Got this ribeye that was absolutely fantastic. It was labeled as prime, but it, it tasted like something even more marbled or more tender than that. It was really amazingly tasty. Getting into fall here, and I had a question about my hot tent. Did some hot tent camping out of the airplane last year. Really enjoyed doing that. One of the concerns that people had was whether they'd be warm enough. And let me tell you my attitude about that. So when it comes to hot tent camping, I view the wood stove as being a way to cook and a way to be comfortable while you're awake. I don't ever want to depend on it when I'm asleep. If it goes out and I don't wake up for a while, it's going to be real cold. Uh, and I definitely don't want to be dependent on it if I can't find any dry wood or any way to, to really keep things going. So what I do is I bring a sleep system that's rated to minus 40. I'm a very, very cold sleeper. So I bring a sleep system that's good down to minus 40. And by doing that, then the wood stove becomes a comfort item instead of a survival item. So I like the stove, I do my cooking, I sit and read, and I'm comfortable. And then when I go to bed, I usually do leave it going, and if I wake up, I'll stock it up or whatever. But I don't depend on it. It's not something where if, if I lose it, I'm going to get hypothermic. So that's kind of been my strategy, and that's worked out really well for me. And as we get back into winter and hot tent season, that's going to be my plan again this year. Okay, the trick coming into autos is that you have to kind of follow the hillside. First time I was here, I ended up high. I had to go around. I had to come and do it again. And that's kind of the deal. But if you do what I'm doing here, and make a nice low approach, and come around on the field, then things work out just fine. Super psyched to welcome our new sponsor, actually our first sponsor for the channel. About six or seven years ago, I started a company called Plane Perfect to make cleaning products for airplanes. So they're safe to use on fabric, fiberglass, aluminum, of course, uh, acrylic, all that stuff. So they came back to me last fall and said, hey, we're really liking your content and we know you know the products. Uh, what would you need in order to do a sponsorship deal? So here we are. So today I used eyes outside to get rid of the filth before we went flying into the morning sun. I'll put a uh, link to their website below. I was brainstorming recipe ideas the other day and thought it would be fun to make a sausage gravy and biscuit empanada. We start with a one pound tube of sausage. I used a spicy one to add some extra punch. By the time it's turned into gravy and wrapped in a biscuit, it's flavorful rather than spicy. First we brown the sausage. Out in the field, it can take a minute to get enough heat to brown things, but the Maillard effect is real, and in a dish like this that is so simple, is seasoning worth working for. Next, we add some flour to act as a thickener in the gravy. This simple gravy is just sausage, flour, and whole milk. After adding the milk, we let things simmer a bit. If it's too thick, just add some more milk. But remember, we're using this as a filling, so we want it to be much thicker than would be used to ladle over biscuits. Seems like every culture on earth has invented the idea of making a simple dough and stuffing it with things. 
Whether they're called pierogi, gyoza, pasties, ravioli, calzones, samosa, or hot pockets, the idea is the same. Make a filling, wrap it in a carb, and cook them up. To keep things simple, we're using biscuit dough from a can. I went with the extra buttery version to film this episode. This was a good choice. Put a bit of flour to keep it from sticking, and I started flattening it by hand. I made this recipe again a few days later and found this hand stuff not to be necessary. Skip it and roll it out with a rolling pin. In terms of size, they need to be big enough to hold a good portion of filling and small enough to eat by hand. So use your judgment. Each flattened biscuit gets a scoop of filling. Wetting the edges allows the pocket to seal properly. Give this a minute before cooking just to allow the edges to set. Then it's into the oil. Use a low heat. Since the empanadas are thick and we want to heat the sausage gravy all the way through, I cooked these at about 325 Fahrenheit. Because of their size, construction style, and that they're fried, I'm declaring these to be empanadas. The word itself comes from the Spanish word empanar, meaning to bread, and would translate as something more like breaded. Today's approach is super easy, with very few ingredients, and therefore great for those who want a less ambitious treat. Out of the oil and onto a paper towel or wire rack to drain the excess oil. And finally, it's time for lunch. I think these are the best dish that I've made for 2023. Just spicy enough to be flavorful, hot enough to warm you up on a cool autumn day, easy enough to not take hours to prepare. I really enjoyed this one and I think you will also. So that's all I have for you today. If you like this kind of content, this channel has about a hundred other videos. So click around and watch some of the other ones and I will see you next time.